All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Okay. It's a bit of a heat going on here. Um, just, I guess, landing from the UK last night, it was, it was kind of nice to be in warm weather again. Um, before I get started, also just want to say that summer school is an amazing opportunity to meet people, to make friends. I feel like the last time that I was at a summer school was maybe like four years ago and I was in Russia and I met sort of some of the most important friends in my life in the summer school. And you don't really think of it that way. You think of it as an opportunity to learn. And it is very much that, especially in this summer school. I mean, amazing lineup of speakers, including myself, but also it's about the people that you meet at the summer school. So definitely sort of capitalize on that, meet people, talk to people and all that. Okay, um, so getting into my presentation itself, um, today I'm aiming to give you a not very gentle introduction to computer vision. And I say not very gentle because I feel that a lot of people here might already have a pretty good idea what computer vision is. I mean, give me a show of hand if you've worked on machine learning. Okay, so everyone. Okay, all right, cool. So yeah, hopefully, as I when I designed this presentation, I sort of tried to tailor it to different level of experience. But do let me know if I'm over explaining things. Okay, cool. Let's get started. So <clears throat> first, the fundamentals. Um, what is computer vision? So when I made this slide, I probably stared at this question for five minutes um, because it seems like such a generic question with so many different answers. Um, and I think what's helpful in answering this question is to maybe look back into the history of how computer vision is defined. And pre-deep learning era, there were many, many different definitions of what computer vision is, which is drastically different, I think, from how we think about it now. So a lot of these definitions, you can sort of see they sort of focus a lot more on images, but these days we don't just look at images, we look at video as well, we look at 3D scenes. Um, they look into sort of uh, learning representation, making decision about physical objects um, and scenes based on sense images. That's still kind of true, but the kind of method that we apply to these things have sort of been, has become a lot more advanced. Um, and it's also worth mentioning the infamous Lena image. I don't know how many, how many of you have seen this, but when I was doing computer vision in my undergrad, this is still, this was still the image that was used for all of the example. And if you don't know the background story about this image, um, it's actually kind of funny. So in the seventies, I think it's in Stanford, they had this like summer assignment of just a group of students, they got together and they decided that they're going to solve computer vision or something. And then they decided that the all of the images that are in their textbook are not good enough like they're not colorful enough they just they're not complex enough and then at this moment in time someone walks in with a playboy magazine and this is literally an image from that um so i put this image here side by side to all the description throughout the years on computer vision as sort of like an example of just how much our field has changed both in terms of how we think about and define computer vision, but also in terms of sort of, I guess, what's deemed appropriate. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so my definition of computer vision is perhaps a very general one, is that it's about understanding and processing visual-based perceptual modalities, but really core and center to what is computer vision, or at least to me, is what is in this image or perhaps what is in this visual scene so can someone give me an answer what is what is in this image whatever i want it to be okay that's that's a what do you want it to be then <laughs> it's a cat okay that's a that's a good answer he's like what do you want me to say come on it's a cat yes it's a cat but what else is in this image or if you look in more detail into the cat you can observe that it's a small gray and white cat it's quite a cute cat and if, if you instead um focus a bit more on motion or if you observe the posture of the cat it's a cat running towards the camera right um 
But the cat is also not only the notable object in the image. Um, if you sort of instead of focusing on the foreground or the animal itself, um, focus a bit more on the background, you can also see that there's a lot more happening in this image. That it's a sunny day, you're in nature, and there's grass, sky, tree, mountains. So really, there are many, many different answers to this question of what is in this image. And it's quite a complex task that we've set out to solve here. So in computer vision, in order to answer this question, we have designed many, many different tasks um, to sort of address different aspects of the answer. So that includes things like image classification, segmentation, captioning, localization, detection, instant segmentation, estimation, blah, blah, blah. A lot of different tasks. Um, and that's, that's it. That's computer vision. Basically, a range of different tasks designed by us, I guess, researchers, scientists, to answer the question, what is in a visual scene? OK, cool. Um, so with that out of the way, I want to get into a bit more detail and talk a little bit about popular architectures in computer vision. And quintessentially, um, I want to talk about convolutional neural network first. Um, so here, I want to give you sort of a slightly different view on convolutional neural network, more of an intuitive look into it. Um, and with that, I want to take MNIST as an example. So if you are not already familiar, the MNIST data set is sort of one of the most popular data set um, in computer vision. It was proposed by Yan Lekun in the 90s, and it basically features these handwritten digits in grayscale. So the task is typically um, digit classification. So there are 10 classes of these digits. Um, and they're quite small images as well, especially in modern deep learning standard re resolution is 28 by 28. So it's a relatively simple task. Um, okay, so let's say now the task is to solve MNIST. Basically, you're given a new, so you're given this data set, you want to train a model or you want to design a system that will help you classify any new handwritten digit that comes your way. OK, so what do you do? Um, a very simple but kind of dumb recipe to solve MNIST would be um, to just simply average the digits in each class and use that as representation. What do I mean by that? So for instance, for digit one, you just take all of the images in that class, and then you just compute a simple average. And you get this blurry looking thing that still kind of looks like one. Um, same thing with all of the other digits. So you basically compute 10 representation, one for each class. Um, and even though that seems kind of blurry, but it kind of does the job, you can kind of tell what number is there. So when you're given a new unseen digit, you can classify it by choosing the class with the lowest L2 norm to the representation. So for instance, you're given this new digit one, and then you compare it to the average representation of class one and average representation of class four and, and basically all of them. And then you say, oh, this one has a smaller distance to class one than to class four. So it is class one. Simple, right? I I mean, when when I saw this solution, I was like, oh, like, why, why was I even bothering with my PhD doing machine learning? This seems really effective and very intuitive. But the problem with this solution is that it can be quite slow and it's difficult to scale. So if you imagine a larger data set than the MNIST data set that we're considering, or if you imagine any real world use cases where there's a data stream coming in, for you to compute this average representation, I mean, it could take a while. And also if your images are not 28 by 28. They're not super small, low resolution images. If they're like 128 by 128, then your representation will be a lot bigger. And also it will be much more time consuming. But most importantly, when your data set becomes more complex, when it's not just digits, when it's, for instance, cats, um, which as we all know, can be anywhere. They just, they, they, yeah, they go crazy. If you get a thousand images of different cats, and you average them, what you're going to end up with is not going to be very recognizably cat. Because what are the chances that they're sort of uh, very nice and centered in the middle of your frame, or just like the background are all consistently black, like what we're seeing here? 
So it's just not a very scalable solution. Um, made a note of the embedding dimension here as well as 28 by 28, which is 784, which is honestly quite big for sort of a task that is of this size and complexity. Okay, so of course we can do better. Um, now introducing a less simple but less dumb recipe to solve MNIST, and this is using classical um, computer vision technique um, called filters and convolutions. Um, so what we can do here is we can look into an image through the lens of a filter, creating a feature map. So the feature map will be the green thing on top and the blue um, grid would be the original image. So filters are introduced in computer vision to highlight a particular aspect of an image. So typically you would have an original image and you would handcraft a filter based on your need. Um, so in this case, we're using a Sobo filter, which is usually used to extract edges from um, the original image and the resulting image, this is kind of blurry, but basically it sort of traces out all the edges in the original image. And there are a bunch of filters uh, like this, but basically uh, the, the way that we do this is through this convolution operation, which is visualized in the animation here. So what we do, is we first perform element-wise multiplication between the filter and the original image. So on the, on the, is this working? Okay, yeah. So on the animation here, what you see is this sort of three by three gray grid that is moving, that's our filter. And you apply it on like a sliding window fashion on the original image. And every time you apply it, you apply this element-wise multiplication between each value of your filter and the corresponding pixel that the filter is being applied to. And then you would sum all of these values. So in this case, you would sum the three by three value and that would become the resulting grid on your feature map. Um, clear so far? Okay, cool. All right, so there are many different filters that you can apply, um, not just the Sobo filter, there's also ridge detection, sharpening, smoothing, so you can have different effects. Um, and by having different filters, you're basically designing different way to extract different features that you're interested in, in the original image. So that's also what we can do with the MNIST images, where we can have a fixed bank of filters extracting the features that we want to extract. And then we apply this to an image um, getting our image features, then we would apply some sort of dimensionality reduction technique, which I'll gloss over here. Uh, but basically you can use things like principal component analysis to just reduce the dimension of your feature map. Um, and then you would get these digit signature um, of the original image. Um, so by doing this, we can reduce the embedding, uh, embedding size from 784 to 218. And now we also have a set of digit signature that describe each image, um, which just makes it sort of more feasible for us or make it more accurate when a new image is coming in and we're trying to classify it. Okay, so is the job done or is it party time yet or can we do better? Um, I mean, obviously we can uh, if you haven't been sleeping in a cave for the last 30 years. Um, so in quintessentially deep learning style, we ask the question, what if we learn these filters through gradient descent? And also further, because it's deep learning, um, can we stack layers of filters on top of each other? So that's essentially how convolutional neural network comes in. So it's a very smart and reasonable way to solve MNIST. Um, so basically this would be a classic CNN where you would have layers of filters on top of each other where each one of these sort of, I guess, feed forward thing would be one layer. Um, and then for each layer, you would have multiple learned filters. Um, I guess to go into a little more detail, this is not quite working for me. To go in a little more detail, um, each of the sort of stack would represent one filter. So like the first layer there, for instance, would have four uh, different learned filters and so on. Um, and the benefit of doing something like this is that one, because data are generated by multiple factors, this is more of a generative model view. I guess 
a, a more common way to interpret this would be that the data that we deal with in real world are usually quite complex and contains multiple different features that we would want to pay attention to. Um, so it makes sense to learn multiple filters. Um, and another thing is we have the stack layers, which allow us to model long range interactions across the entire image. Um, and also by sort of the property of convolution, the operation itself, the convolutional neural network is translation invariant, which is a nice property to have because you don't really want the prediction or the feature to change just because you've shifted the image. Um, so that's a nice property. And then also you're using weight sharing here because you're applying one single filter across the entire image. Um, so then the, the feature that you extract, there's some sort of consistency within them. I put an asterisk next to the translation invariant point because um, there's this really good paper by Richard Jang from Adobe in 2019, I think, uh, that basically showed that CNNs are not actually translation invariants. So if you're interested, feel free to go and check it out. I'm sure the organizers will share the slides afterwards. Um, okay, cool. So in deep learning, um, there's a lot of popular CNN architectures that we use these days. Here I show some examples. I would say sort of on, on this image, um, AlexNet, VGG, they're sort of more, um, they're slightly older architecture these days. The more modern or more commonly used architectures are things like ResNet and DenseNet. Um, but what you can see is that they're pretty much the same things. They're layers of convolutions stacked on top of each other, extracting features from an image. And then um, it basically have you append that with like a fully connected layer typically in the end, which is the sort of just the final layer at the bottom there to shape it to the desirable size of your representation or your embedding. Um, okay, cool. So, what are some downsides of CNN? Um, to show this, I kind of think it's helpful to have a side-by-side -side comparison between CNN and MLP, which is multi-layer perceptron. Basically, it's a densely connected layer. Um, so in MLP, you allow for all-to-all relationship. So if you just focus on, um, I guess, the, the bottom yellow and blue rows there, um, for MLP on the left-hand side, what you can see is that all of the input nodes are responsible for each output nodes. There's a connection between each of them. So what this means is that each of your features, uh, each of your resulting features in your MLP um, attend to all of the input value. But this is not really the case if you look at CNN on the right-hand side, where each blue node corresponds to just uh, two of the neighboring yellow nodes. So there's a certain level of locality there with CNN. Um, so uh, it only, so here, uh, it only, only nearby pixel will take part in the computation of the final representation. And the reason that it is, uh, it is designed like this is that it becomes a lot more computationally efficient. You would have, you would be using less weight in CNN, making the network a lot more, a lot easier to optimize, but this sort of relational bias can also introduce some downsides. For instance, if you have an image like this and the two patches that are far away from each other just don't really have a chance to sort of come together and form your representation, which means that it's relatively difficult for the model to learn the relationship between patches that are far away from each other. And that's not necessarily ideal. So this is where transformers come in. Um, and I think of transformer as sort of this sweet point between CNN and MLP in that it allows you to sort of have global attention. It allows the representation to apply global attention to the entire input, um, but in sort of a smart way. Um, and I remember, I think Transformer, the paper itself came out in 2017, and I didn't start looking into it until maybe 2020, when my PhD supervisor, Phil Tor, was nagging me monthly to explain to him what Transformer means. Um, and it sort of went on for half a year before I actually dived into it. And I think 
part of the reason why we were all a little bit confused in the beginning is really because this diagram itself is just kind of daunting in that it's like it's colorful and it's presented as like a very approachable thing but but it's not really there's so many sort of interconnected things and you don't know what the blocks mean necessarily so it's like what what is a transformer right so today um i think later today one of my colleagues sahan will give you a more in-depth view of transformer but here i'm again trying to offer a higher level intuition of what transformer is um okay cool so let's dive in just a little bit um so if we look at sort of the high level architecture of a transformer abstracting away all of the colorful block um, what transformer is, is basically this encoder decoder structure without any convolution. Um, so here you have a stack of encoder layers and then a stack of decoder layers. You have your input, which is in French, which I will not attempt to pronounce. Um, the encoder will take in the, the input and then it generates this output, which is then sort of fed as input to each layer of the decoder. And the decoder is again sort of pass in this like feed forward fashion and then you have your output which is the translation of the original image and the model is learned in a supervised way where you're given sort of the ground truth of what the translation should be and and it's trained like this all right okay so that seems simple enough let's zoom in for a little bit more so let's look at each layer of our encoder so each layer of the encoder just contains these two sub layers um, so we have a self-attention layer, which we'll get to, but we also have this feed-forward neural network. A feed-forward neural network is basically an MLP, so there's nothing special here. So really the main innovation here, or just the main question here is what is self-attention? What does that do? Um, so from a very high level, a self-attention layer, its purpose is to compute a representation of an input by relating elements of input sequence with each other. So let's take a sentence as an example. I hope you can read my handwriting here. Um, so the this sentence says, the animal didn't cross the street because it was tired. And let's say we want to model the word it. We want to learn a representation for the, the word here, it. And the way that the self-attention layer does this is by looking at this entire sentence word by word, and then picking out the words that are important in describing our target word it and then it would assign sort of relative weighting to each of these words saying oh you know for instance in this sentence the animal is actually the it that it's referring to here so we'll we'll give it a high weight in explaining what it mean um, and same goes with the street because that's what the animal is interacting with we'll give that a relatively high rate as well and finally the word itself, it, is also quite explanatory to itself. So we'll also give that a higher weighting. So we basically say, oh, this word it, we can, to, to know what this means, we look at the animal, the street, and it, and that's it. So does that, does that make sense? From a computational level, this is what happens. Okay, so here I'm using a different example. So the input here is this sentence, thinking machine. So the input sequence length is two. Um, and we're trying to learn a representation for this sentence, for each word as they are grounding in the sentence, think, uh, thinking machine. So what, the way that we do this is we first generate these embeddings for each word. So this is just sort of common practice in NLP where you tokenize the words and then you put it through a linear projection, like a fully connected linear, linear layer. And then you generate these continuous embeddings, one for each word. And then you would have these matrices, WQ, WK, WV, corresponding to queries, keys, values. So the, the naming here is not really that important at this point. At this point, they're just the same, the same matrix. Um, they're the, the same size, let's say. Um, and these matrices will learn them through gradient descent. Um, and what we do is we take each of these matrices, we uh, perform matrix multiplication to the embedding itself, generating for each of the embedding a set of query keys and values. Um, 
And the, the naming query keys and value describe sort of their functionality somewhere down the line in the computation of the self-attention layer, which we'll get to soon enough. But basically, all you need to know is that each word are now represented by this set of three vectors, query key values. OK, so let's move on. So then once we have these um, set of values that are describing each word, um, what we do is we compute this dot product um, between the query and the key. So for instance, let's say we're now interested in learning um, thinking, in representing thinking in this sentence. What we do is we take the query of thinking and then we apply dot product between the query of thinking Q1 and then all of the values in this sentence. So we apply uh, apply dot product between Q1 and V1 and V2. Um, so here's a visualization of why we're doing this dot product thing. So let's say if the query and the keys are pointing towards a similar direction um, in sort of your, your vector space, then you will have a large dot product, right? But if they're not pointing in a similar direction, if they're pointing in opposite direction, then you would have a small dot product. So the way, the, the reason that we have this dot product here is basically measuring how aligned are your query and key pairs and assigning larger values for those that are aligned and lower values for those that aren't. Um, and we call the result of this dot product, the score. So as you can see here, thinking the word itself would have a higher score in its own sort of query key pair compared to machine. Um, and then what you do is you normalize the score across the entire sentence. So that is sums to one. And that's it. That's sort of your softmax score, which is then used in the next stage of computation. So we take this value, which is the only representation in our words that we haven't used yet. And we take this softmax value that we have just computed and we compute sort of, uh, we basically multiply them together. So now for the word thinking, We'd, we would have these two set of values. One is itself, and then one is from machines, and they're weighted by the softmax that we computed. Um, and then we would sum these values together in the end to form the representation for thinking. So basically, all that's happened here is the model is trying to figure out to represent the word thinking, how much do we need to factor in the word thinking itself, and also how much do we need to factor in the word machine? And then we sum it together to form the final representation of itself. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so that's it. That's the self-attention layer. And now we know what that is. Zooming out a little bit again, um, there's a bit more detail that I slightly glossed over in our encoder layer. So we have this self-attention layer that takes in the representation of each word. Uh, takes in the embedding of each word. We generate this representation using the dot product and everything. Um, and then what we have here is a residual connection. So basically after computing the representation for each word, we would add that to the original embedding of the word. Um, and that would give us our final representation from the self-attention layer. And that's put through the feed forward layer. And then we do again, the residual connection where we add the input to the output and then we get the output of the self-attention layer and that's it. And then we repeat this n times because we're doing multiple layers stacked together. So again, zooming out even further, if we look at the transformer architecture again, now it doesn't need to be so confusing. Um, what we have is the encoder, um, which we've gone through. Um, and then on the decoder side, the only difference between the decoder and the encoder is that you have this extra self-attention block. So instead of just one self-attention block, you have two self-attention block, and that's it. Um, there's a, a bit more detail that I'm skipping here, but I got to leave some room for Sahan this afternoon. Um, and But that's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all you need to know for the purpose of this lecture. Um, the one thing that I haven't covered here is this positional encoding. So if you were paying attention previously when we had this slide, um, where we're computing the representation for each value in the sentence, you'll notice that there's not really any way for the model to know which position each of these embedding come from. So we're just doing a simple sum at the end here without really knowing um, which word is in which position. 
And if you know anything about language, you would know that position is important, right? Like in grammar structure, it plays such a big role. So we absolutely need to model that. Um, when we're building a language model as well. And the way that they propose to do this is basically through this positional embedding where when you're computing, so like before going into the self-attention layer, when you're computing the embedding of each word, what you do is you take the word embedding and then you have these positional encoding, which is sort of somewhat handcrafted. You would have a unique positional encoding for each position in the sentence. And these values pretty much stay fixed throughout the entire training trajectory. I say pretty much because there are variation where you're learning these positional embedding, but um, here you can just consider them as unique and fixed. And then you would add them to the original embedding. They're of the, sa the same dimension. You come up with this final embedding with the time signal that is aware of the sort of sequence of the original sentence. And that's it. Um, now you know Transformer. Um, okay, so how does this relate to vision? Well, um, not too long ago, I can't remember exactly when, maybe two, three years ago, um, the computer vision, people in computer vision sort of decided to wake up and, and smell the, I guess, all the benefit uh, that Transformer is bringing to NLP. Um, so a group of researchers from Google Brain, the Grand Vision Group, um, came up with this vision transformer. Um, and it's really surprisingly simple and elegant and similar to the original transformer architecture. Um, turns out there's a lot of similarity between modeling images and modeling um, language. Um, so the two modification, the two key modification that they made here is that one, they got rid of the decoder uh, part of the transformer, making it even simpler because all they care about is learning this representation for the image, um, not necessarily to reconstruct um, the original image. So encoder only architecture. Um, and then another thing is that instead of taking words, sentences as input, it takes image patches as input. So um, instead of having words, they have these 16 by 16 patches and they put them in a sequence and then they model it in exactly the same way as we introduced before, where you compute the self-attention between one patch and all of the other patch in the image. So you explain one patch of the image with all of the other patches um, in the image and, and that's it. And it works really, really well, surprisingly. Um, so if you look at sort of a comparison between Vision Transformer and CNN, one thing is it allows for the model to pay global attention to the entire image and not just the local correlation by design of convolutional neural network. Um, and in the original paper of Vision Transformer, they also show this sort of attention map of their model that just sort of comes out as the training progresses naturally. And you can sort of see that the attention map does make sense and it, uh, takes, uh, it sort of pays attention to relevant semantic part of the image that's needed to address the task at hand. And then another thing is it has much better performance with scale and with scale here should really be emphasized. Um, so here, the key result of the paper is on the JFT data set, which has 3 billion images. And that's really, really big. Um, and they show that basically by using their vision transformer architecture, they outperform ResNet by a lot while using way less compute. Um, which is great. But if you're for sort of day-to-day -day practice of machine learning um, with access to university level resources, not necessarily JFT, um, I would say that on a smaller scale, ResNet still outperforms um, Vision Transformer. So that's definitely something to sort of keep note of and pay attention to when implementing these models. Okay. All right, I'm gonna have a drink of water. Do we have any questions? Um, can you explain a little bit how did the patches, uh, how the patches were given to the um, VIT model, uh, where they like uh, passed to a CNN or something, and you got a representation, and then you encoded the uh, the position of it, or was it given like pixel wise, pixel for pixel? 
so you said that for Vision Transformer, you split the images into nine patches and then you feed them into the encoder, the transformer. Um, is it given like per pixel value or, uh, and then you encode the position of the pixel or do you first extract some features with a CMA or something and then you encode this patch and then you have like, a, I don't know, like a ninth dimensional one half vector of which pixel is where. Okay, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, I did gloss over that part maybe. So um, the question is basically, are we treating sort of, I guess each pixel value as one single element to the element of input to the transformer? The answer is no. What you do is, you compute an embedding for each of these image patches. Um, so each image patch would be the analogous to one word in an LP. Um, and then you, yeah, and then you treat, you would also apply positional encoding. In this case, you would apply nine different values of positional encoding because there are nine patches um, and you process the net network that way. So usually in Vision Transformer uh, or in the original paper, they use 16 by 16 patch size, um, but typically this should scale with your image resolution as well. Um, and because the vision transformer or transformer itself, it really keeps the dimension of your representation constant. So it doesn't change throughout the entire model because we have these like residual layers or typically it doesn't change. Um, so your patch size will actually decide the dimension of your final representation. So that's also something to pay attention to. So in the extreme case, you can imagine having a patch size of one by one where you're modeling each pixel um, as one unit, as you said. Um, but in this case, you would end up with a huge representation. And that would be sort of the trade-off that you need to consider. Um, there's also now work that looks into how can we have flexible patch sizes throughout training. It's called FlexiVid, um, which is also really interesting. You should go check it out. OK, yeah. I think the volunteer will hand you a mic. Thank you. I had a quick question on the invariant properties that the models learn. So you mentioned the CNNs are, uh, to some extent, translation invariant, um, and transformers should be permutation invariant. Uh, what does it happen to to you know when you apply Envision transformer? Does, does this translation invariant property still is it preserved? Like if you shift the image, what does it happen? Um, because I'm assuming that because you, you're splitting the images in patches. Of course, the order, the position is important to reconstruct the representation of the image. But if you have the same image translated, you end up by having a different representation with a vision transformer. Yeah, um, great question. So uh, first thing I want to note is that the vision transformer is not permutation invariant because we do have this positional encoding. So if you change the location of each of the patch, then you're going to end up with a different representation. Um, so that's one thing. Um, so in terms of translation invariance, it's kind of a myth, even in CNN. So I talked about this paper by Richard Jang when in the CNN slide, um, where they basically show that because in CNN, you don't just have the CNN layers, you also have some pulling layers that will allow you to sort of reduce your receptive field, basically changes the dimension of your representation. And because of these pulling layers, CNNs are not really translation invariant. You end up with a different representation um, when you translate the image. And to some extent, in the extreme of translation, if you shift the entire image by half the image, even if you have a network that's translation invariant, the representation is going to be different. Um, so with Vision Transformer, this property doesn't naturally exist. It's not even designed or supposed to be translational invariant. Um, but because of the magic of deep learning and big data regime, typically, if you shift an image, it doesn't mean that it's lost all of its meaning if your model is trained properly. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your yeah, question. Uh, do, you, do you need, do you believe the two sort of get the same properties to some extent, you still need the resources that are available typically in industrial settings though? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Nothing is guaranteed. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Happy to answer more questions um, offline. Okay, cool. I want to get to sort of the fun bit 
which is the methods. So now we've Hello. Okay. Now we've introduced the architecture. We have a set of tools. Um, how are we going to apply our tool to answer this question? What is in this image? Um, so really, we change the question from what is computer vision to how to computer vision. Um, in classic setup, we have the supervised learning regime, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, which is basically you're given an image X and a target label Y, and then you train this model that is designed to predict exactly why given X as input. So the model here predicts uh, that this is a dog. So we notate this as Y prime, you're given this X of Y, and then you optimize this model using gradient descent by minimizing some distance between Y and Y prime. So this would be a classic image classification setup um, where you're given an image, you basically tell, tell us what, what, what is in the, what's the class label that's assigned to this image. You can also change the Y to change the task. So for instance, in semantic segmentation, you would change this Y to this semantic map where each pixel in the image is accounted for. So you're basically labeling each pixel in the original image. And here the yellow basically means all of these pixels are cat. Um, all of these pixels that are green, they're the grass and et cetera, et cetera. So this is like a much, I guess, denser task. And the model is again trained to predict the original ground truth label and optimized in a similar way. By the same token, even when you move to multi-model setting where you have image captioning tasks, you would use the exactly same regime where for each image, you're given these like ground truth um, annotation of caption to the image, usually notated by someone um, human uh, <laughs> or, or not really these days. Um, and uh, I mean by VLM. Um, so, um, and the model is trained to generate a prediction or a caption of the original image. And then you do the same thing where you match exactly this prediction to this ground truth, which honestly sounds kind of insane for, for this task specifically, um, because there are so many different ways to describe this one image, right? I feel like each of you can come up with your own caption and they won't be the same, but none of them will be um, wildly wrong, at least. Um, anyways, that's a digression. Um, okay, so we have we have these different ways of um, doing different computer vision tasks using under the supervised learning regime. Um, but if we think about it a little bit here, the problem with all of these settings that I've just described is that none of these single computer vision tasks actually give us an answer or just like give us all of the answer to the question of what is in this image, right? They just address one aspect of it, but not all of it at once. So how can we how can we do that? Because if we want to have a computer vision system that's truly useful, um, that's sort of, I guess, open-ended in its nature that we can just take and then deploy in the real world and answer all of the questions that we might have about sort of a vision scene or that a human can answer, about a vision scene. So how do we do that? Well, one way we can do this is what if we just use all of the labels? We just deep learning um, this, this problem away where when we're given this image X, we just give the model um, the ground truth to all of these different tasks. And then maybe by doing that, the model can eventually learn enough features about this image that it can be sort of universally useful. Is that a good solution or is that feasible even? Well, we have actually seen very decent work on that, that sort of that, that use it, this school of thinking. Um, for instance, Unified IO, which came out uh, very recently, basically uh, proposed this model that can solve all of the computer vision tasks at once. And it's very impressive. Same with pix 2 sick And then there's like UVM, there's a lot of work in, in this area now. Um, and while they're really impressive in what they can do, um, if we look a bit closer, we see that these models are very data hungry and are quite fini uh, finicky. So here I took some screenshot from the unified IO paper. Um, 
and they mentioned sort of how this, this is sort of basically they're describing how they're training their model. Um, so they mentioned things like they use ensemble 95 different data sets from 62 publicly available data sources. And then in order to have the model solve each task efficiently without sort of biasing towards a simpler task and stuff like that, they also need to mix these different data set in a careful way. So here they mention um, equally sample each group one eighth except for image synthesis three out of 16. So it's, it's really complicated. It's a very impressive piece of work but you can sort of see by the description here just how much the authors have banged their head against the wall uh, when trying to design a model like this, right? So it's it's very complicated, which means that it's not very scalable. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is it doesn't necessarily cover all tasks because the world that we live in is constantly changing and new properties are constantly emerging. Um, and new computer vision tasks come along every day as well um, because we're constantly interested in new things um, and because of that it's sort of you're sort of fighting an uphill battle that's what i'm trying to describe here um, because you can't cover all of the tasks it's just it's not feasible okay cool so with that can we do better is there is is this pointless um should we just all stop doing what we're doing and go home um so this is a segue for me to introduce unsupervised learning as sort of an alternative regime to solve these computer vision tasks. Um, and what does that mean? So I think unsupervised learning is maybe better sort of explained as self-supervised learning, where you train these models to play these games. You train these models on these pretext tasks. And there are two set or two sort of style of pretext tasks that I want to highlight here. One style is this sort of impaint reconstruct style. So in this case, you're given an image. Sometimes you mask out a portion of the image and you ask the model to impaint the missing part of the image. Or in sort of a more classic regime, what you do is you're given the original image to start with and you put it through an encoder and decoder network and you ask the model to reconstruct the original image. And what happens, so what comes out between the encoder and the decoder would be your representation. And in order for the model to be able to complete these tasks in, in that it needs to sort of accurately reconstruct the original image, it needs to gain a certain level of understanding of what's in the scene. And what's important to the model, we leave that to the model, uh, up to the model's interpretation. We don't define it. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is contrast. So by uh, with contrast, we utilize a set of different augmentations that are known to us. So in this case, we take the original image, we make it black and white, we can flip it, rotate it, or we can increase the brightness, contrast, or sometimes we add noise to it. What we do is basically we apply these augmentations to change the style of the original image without altering the content of the original image. And then we tell the model, hey, this original image and all of these images, they are featuring the same thing. So tell me what that, what that thing is. So that's contrast. Um, and with these different two different types of pretext tasks comes out uh, two different regimes uh, or popular school of thinking in unsupervised learning. One is the autoencoder slash mass autoencoder style of work. Um, and then the other is augmentation-based self-supervised learning. So I'll introduce both. Um, so the first one, autoencoder. Um, oh, sorry, before I get into the detail of these models, um, I also want to highlight after the pre-training step, which is sort of the training of these models, we call that pre-training because we don't have access to any labels. Uh, it's important to think a little bit about how we're going to evaluate these models, right? And because I talk about unsupervised learning as sort of like uh, an alternative to supervised learning, more importantly, how do we compare the performance of these unsupervised learning model to supervised learning model? Um, so that's what this slide is doing. We're describing this. So after the pre-training step, we freeze the encoder, which we train um, with the unsupervised learning objective. And then we fit a linear layer on top for the task of interest. So we would freeze the encoder 
um, and we're given a set of labels to train just the linear layer. So when we're evaluating these models, what we're evaluating is how good are these representations that are learned from these models. And because the linear layer is relatively sim simple and cheap to change, uh, to train, it's not very data hungry. Um, it sort of basically allow us to fit the model on a task using much less data compared to supervised models. Um, and this also allows us to evaluate them on the same supervised learning tasks. Okay. Um, some of the benefits of doing unsupervised learning, it doesn't require label, so it allows us to use more training data apart from the final stage where we're training the linear layer, of course. Um, but then also, these two points are a bit more nuanced, so I'll spend a little bit more time on them. Um, so the second benefit is that it requires less human bias or noise that are introduced in the labeling process. And the third benefit is that it has more of an open-ended objective in that the model is more likely to learn from the data. So what do I mean by that? Um, this is maybe one of my favorite paper ever. Uh, it's called, Are We Done With ImageNet? Um, ImageNet is this popular data set used in computer vision. Um, and this is sort of done by, again, a group of researchers at Google in 2020. So basically what they do here is, this is basically a set of images from ImageNet. And ImageNet is image classification task. So each of these images, is described by just one label. Um, so basically just one word. Um, so now I'm going to play a fun interactive game with members of the audience. I mean, don't you just love it when you're just sitting there um, watching a lecture, minding your own business, and then suddenly the demonstrator wants to play a fun and interactive game? Um, OK, can someone tell me what the how, how would you describe the first image with just one word? Huh? Zoom in. Can, I don't know. Can somebody come forward? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I I don't know if uh are we tech technologically advanced enough to zoom in? Um. Okay. What if uh what about the second image? Maybe that's a bit easier to see. Tools. Okay. That's a good guess, but it's not the answer. So the second image is labeled by ImageNet or in ImageNet as hammer. What about the third image? Just one more. What? Net what? Net what? Office. OK, office. That's, that's also objectively a better label than what's given in ImageNet, um, which is a monitor, which only takes up sort of like a small part of the original image. And then there's things like, this is like a table full of vegetable, but that's just, apparently it's just a zucchini. And then the last one is an ant. Um, you can probably barely see the ant. It's next to the main insect. I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So importantly, the lesson that we're learning here is that in a supervised learning regime, if the model is given these images as X, and tasked to predict exactly these labels, then we will discard all of the information that is irrelevant to the prediction. And this is because of the supervised learning objective that we're using here. It only serves to minimize the distance between its prediction and the original ground truth, which means that the model has no incentive to learn anything more about its input image beyond minimizing this loss itself. So it just won't. Um, and this could cause problem when applying these models to downstream tasks where those discarded features are relevant. So this is why unsupervised learning is powerful because when you're using, when you're, for instance, training a model using this autoencoder scheme. So I'm taking, again, one of the images from the last slide as an example. You take in this image in the, uh, in the encoder and it compresses it into some representation Z. And then the decoder needs to take only this representation Z and accurately reconstruct the original input image. And the magic here really is that this Z is a very low dimension vector. So in order for the model to still be able to reconstruct the original image very accurately, Z has to contain all the information that's needed to reconstruct the original input X. And so basically, um, 
your encoder will have to work really hard here um, to do the compression for the decoder to be successful in its reconstruction. And there's less chance that the model will discard features because then you just reconstruct part of the image. Um, how, I should mention that this is not the magic solution to, to everything. This is not just like, oh, we've solved deep learning. Um, we don't need to use labels ever now. Um, because the shortcoming of this style of training is that it has less specificity in that because the model doesn't really know what to pay attention to, it pays attention to everything, but not in sort of such a hyper-focused way as supervised learning. So it would have poorer performance compared to supervised learning on the specific task that you're training your supervised learning model on. Um, but when it comes to transfer, so if you're training a model on one task and you transfer it to a different task, so let's say you train a supervised learning model on image classification, and now you want to do image captioning using that same set of representation that you learn from image classification, um, then it wouldn't do as good a job uh, compared to unsupervised learning approaches um, in general. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, just that's what the theory indicates anyways. Um, and then um, also more recently, so autoencoder is a very classic regime in computer vision. It's been around forever. And the mass autoencoder auto came out in 2021, proposed by Kai Minghe um, at FAIR. Um, so basically what they propose is you randomly mask out a portion of the original image, uh, in this case, a relatively high portion, actually. And you do the same encoder and decoder thing, um, and you train the model to impaint the missing part of the original image. Um, so again, there are two important design choices in mass autoencoder. One thing is that it would mask quite a high proportion of the input image. And then the second thing is that they use quite a lightweight decoder. So both of these design choices really ensures that your encoder has to work really hard to sort of represent all aspects of the image in order for the lightweight decoder to be able to reconstruct the original image. So it plays more emphasis on the representation learning part of this. OK, um, and the yeah, basically what I just said. OK. Um, and also, just to go into the intuition of doing this, um, we can go back to language again. So um, I think many of you should be familiar with sort of mass language modeling as well, where, for instance, in BERT, you would mask out um, different parts of a sentence, and then the job of the model is basically to predict the missing part of the image. And the mass image modeling regime basically draw from this intuition um, where you sort of would randomly mask out parts of the image and ask the model to impaint the missing part. And by doing this, we're hoping that the model will have to learn some semantic information about the original input. So apart from MAE, there are also many other different ways of doing this, just applying different random mask and using sort of different models and architecture, for instance, bait and things like that. Um, one thing that I do want to note here is that random word masks are not the same with random pixel masks. So I think your question actually sort of sort of indicated or hinted towards this a little bit as well. Because when you look at random, uh, when you look at word, uh, when you look at these sort of image masks, they're sort of easy-ish to impaint without semantic context. Because what you can do is basically just doing line tracing, tracing between sort of just like the existing part of the image without really needing to understand what is being depicted in the image. But in order to impaint these words, you sort of have to read the whole sentence and think a little bit about what it's trying to describe. And then you know what those words are. Um, so uh, I might skip over this part. Um, OK, so the question that we ask here is, what is word level mask in image space? Um, so in a work that I did at the end of my PhD, what we propose is this model that will learn a masking model in an unsupervised way alongside this mass image modeling framework, such that you are such that you're masking out a complete semantic entity of the original image and thus making the impainting uh, task 
more difficult. Um, and by doing this, we also observe that we don't have to mass out 75% of the image like the mass autoencoder work suggests. We, it's, it's more important what you mask out as opposed to how much you mask out. Um, okay, cool. So now let's move on to augmentation-based self-supervised learning. Um, so this is sort of, I, I think this would be the last part of this lecture. So this is the other regime in unsupervised learning where you take the original image and you apply two set of random augmentation to the original image. And you would train these encoders and uh, you would have the same encoder for each of these augmented version of the original image, getting representation ZA and ZB, one for each augmented image. Um, and the intuition here is that the encoder should minimize the distance between ZA and ZB so that images that are semantically similar in image space would also have a small distance in feature space. So there are many, many work that sort of just follows this basic intuition. Um, this would be things like SimClear, SimCM, BIOL, and things like that. Um, I encourage you to sort of look into the literature or just like there are always many blog posts on, on this sort of method, but really that's the principle that it follows to apply augmentation, change the style, and then telling the model that they're the same image. And that's pretty much it.